You're listening to The Peach Pit. I'm here talking with Ben and Justin from the band Source from Boulder, Colorado. Their album, Ethereal Self, is out now. You need to go check it out. And if you haven't listened to them yet, well, frankly, that means you haven't been listening to my show, and I take that personally. <laughs> ben and Justin, thank you so much for taking time to talk to me, and welcome to The Pit. Thanks, man. Yeah, thanks, thanks for having us. Congrats for having the album come out. How does it feel? It's been intense. We've filled a lot of orders and uh, we decided to leave the record label we were with for our first two albums. And that was a really good choice. And it feels like it made more work, but I don't think it actually did uh, considering, yeah, how things went with our label. But um, I think we've just made more fans, I think, touring. And you know, we don't play for a lot of people, but the people we play for it's a really memorable experience. So we kind of hook people and make fans like pretty, you know, super fans pretty quickly, which is a huge compliment to, you know, we feel great about that. And so a lot of the orders that we were filling this time around was just, you know, people we met on the totality tour, our last record. And so it's, it's pretty humbling to see how many people really wanted this album and paid for it a year in advance. A lot of people it was really cool. Yeah, there's there's a fan and then there's a super fan, right? And they'll just give you the shirt off their back to see you perform live, right? Yeah. Yeah, we have a few of those. Yeah, it's really nice to have that support. So let's let's backtrack for them. Give give me I need to know your guys' origin stories because I, I always imagine all musicians as being superheroes and all superheroes have origin stories. So take me back, just if I can ask you, how do you guys remember falling in love with music and finding a passion for heavier styles of music? Yeah, so when I was a kid I, I found this crystal and I ate it. And uh, all of a sudden, I just had musical talent. <laughs> I believe you 100%. That <laughs> yeah, it was a kyber crystal, actually. You're not supposed to eat kyber crystals, but... Um... <laughs> so everybody Google it, and it'll make you more metal. <laughs> yeah, maybe. I don't know. It'll definitely make you more nerdy if you, if you Google kyber crystal, that's for sure. <laughs> yep. Um, no, I, I think... I, I think all, me and Justin both have fallen in love with music with probably like our earliest memories or listening to music or something along those lines. Yeah, for sure. And I think so the, that started the path for you. I mean, when did you start playing drums? Started in middle school when I was like about 11, 10 or 11. Wow. Like that. Did you play any music before that? Yeah. Yeah. I played some clarinet and recorder a little bit before that. Yeah, so, and it, it, then you play guitar and bass a little bit now, and mm -hmm. so you play, like, all the instruments, basically. Um, I play everything but drums at this point. I can't really play drums, but I can program drums. So I think me and Justin both have been diving deep into music and trying to understand its wholeness, not just one part of it, for a long time. Um, and I think I would say, what was your first heavy band that you got heavy into? Heavy band? Yeah. Yeah. Um... Probably Rage Against the Machine. Me yes. Yeah. 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 Yes. Dude, Rage, Rage was it. Like I think Corn too, and Corn for you. Corn a little bit. Too. Yeah. It was the same time, right? Yeah. Rage was the first one for sure. Yeah. Rage. <sighs> yeah. So, and I, I got into like Limp Bizkit. And, I mean, who didn't get into Limp yeah. Bizkit? Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Who? I mean, I have full on had the like red New York Yankees hat though, and I was like, I won't be Fred Durst, man. And, <laughs> <laughs> um. So, yeah, but but then I sort of – I got into a bunch of hippie music after that. And I think people who listen to – like if you listen to a kind of obscure hippie band, maybe not obscure, but uh, Sound Tribe Sector 9, it's like this weird, like, Jamtronica band. And they're, they're really good. And I think, you know, it's funny. I think a lot of my melodic content will come from that as well, you know. So I have, I have a wide list of influences. But I went to go see them – at Bonnaroo and ended up seeing Tool beforehand and like <laughs> saw a bunch of crying hippies running away from the show. And I was like, I want to go in there. That looks amazing. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I mean, I don't know how many people were there, 50 plus thousand people all just screaming the words. I'd never seen anybody, like any group of fans more rapidly excited to like see a band, you know? <laughs> so... Um, so that got me hooked on Tool, and uh, that started a whole process of getting into Opeth and Mastodon and Between the Buried and Me. And I'd heard 
Opeth and Between the Buried and Me in high school too. So I had been listening to heavier stuff with my friends uh, for a while, but Tool was sort of the thing that was like, all right, here we go. I want to do this. And that kind of started the whole process of me eventually stopping playing piano and learning how to play guitar. And that's, that's kind of how the band started was I learned how to, I got a guitar and within six months I'd already written the first, you know, a first, a couple, good amount of the songs on uh, our first album, Return to Nothing. And so, yeah, it's, it sort of snowballed from there. I started the band with different members and met Justin in 2017. Yep. Yeah. And so we, we got rid of our first drummer and Justin came on in 2017, which has been just like the greatest change ever and shifted through multiple bass players until we found Jake who recorded this last album with us. And his, his style is just really perfect for us. So it seems, it feels, feels really synergistic. It kind of feels like there's that, like, I don't know, that sort of mystical thing, like where the right people are in the right place, I guess. And that's just this album that this lineup has been that. And then, so how about for you, Justin? What has your musical evolution been like? Because I'm assuming that when you guys got together, there must have been some grounds that you already agreed on, like bands like Tool. But uh, how did you get there? Yeah, um, a little different of a path. I I was in, you know, I started playing drums um, in middle school and was you know, got all into the band nerdy stuff and did band, um, pretty much anything I could do. Um, and then was like, I had some friends and we were in a band in high school, kind of like a metal thing. And I played with a bunch of older guys that was more of like a jam rock type thing. And so I like just like every type type of music for the most part. And, um, yeah, just kept being in bands. I ended up kind of taking a different path and got an electrical engineering degree um, and was an electrical engineer for a while. But 10 uh, years. Yeah. <laughs> it's not years. a while. <laughs> um, uh, eventually just decided that that wasn't the life for me. And, and then I saw that this drummer for Source was leaving. And so um, I had heard about them. Um, and I was also a local from the Boulder, Denver area. Um, so I thought it might be a good fit and I reached out and Jeff yeah, from there, you know, it's kind of been just a fun ride, um, with this group and all the music we've created. So, so far, have you guys per- done any shows together as a band or was that all kind of with our new bassist? We've played one show. Yeah. It was on a farm, our friend's farm for about 20 people on Halloween last year. Cause he joined, in february of 2020 and we had dates lined up to go out to south by southwest and back and so we were like yo we really need to get this locked down um like let's learn the set let's get it going and then everything fell through like i mean COVID happened right yeah right we were like two days from packing up and leaving yeah and then i was like i went <laughs> i went down to get groceries and everyone was in full-on like apocalypse mode yeah, and I'm like, holy shit, this is the what is going on. And I got home and I was like, I don't want to be in the world right now. This is crazy. Like, I just moved up on top of a mountain. I kind of want to just stay here until this shit passes. <laughs> and so I talked to our agent. I was like, Nick, I don't think we can do this. He's like, dude, everybody's canceling. It's probably going to get canceled. You should just cancel. And I was like, all right. And we canceled. And then lockdown happened the next day. And we we're like, all right, well, there's that. So we just moved to focusing on writing the album and finishing it. Most of most of what is on the album was written before lockdown, but Pupa was written during lockdown. Uh, me and Justin had a lot of time on our hands, and we had a lot of fun writing that song. And it is, you know, it is inspired by that whole experience. And the song, the it's the last song of the album. It's really about like how, like the metaphor of of. Uh, like a moth become like a you know larva becoming a moth in like, through the chrysalis right is was sort of a metaphor for lockdown itself and the beginnings of hopefully people starting to approach their lives differently than they had before just i think so many people saw how how when something really bad happens you know and a lot of people got really screwed so i shouldn't always say this but i think a lot of people saw that when something really bad happens that there is something that comes in to support like 
whether it's family or just the universe. I think a lot of people have found, you know, like people have gotten a lot of unemployment that they wouldn't have gotten um, because everyone was just screwed and nobody knew what to do. And again, like there are so many more homeless people than there used to be. But I do think that uh, I feel like this is sort of moments like this are the beginnings of humanity taking a real look at itself and trying to stop all of the really unsustainable stuff that is going on. And like, the sad part is the airline industries are still running all of the flights during lockdown with nobody on them, just wasting gasoline, destroying, <laughs> destroying the ozone. So it's, you know, but I think things like that make people see like, wow, they really don't care. <laughs> they don't care one bit. And that's the beginnings of at least, at least some kind of change, I think. And so I think that's what the song is really about. Um, but yeah, it's, you know, so then we recorded the album ourselves at our studio and Justin um, has recorded, been recording for a long time, but I think we were just, we did our last album with Ulrich Wilde and learned a lot. And we were kind of like, let's just try this ourselves and see how it goes. See if we can save ourselves a lot of money. And, you know, I think if, if you think it sounds pro, then I think we did a good job. <laughs> Justin really killed it, man. He's uh, he's a great engineer and we had so much fun with the production and everything. You said that uh, most of the material was finished before you went into lockdown mode. So having this song to focus on and be creative with, what was that like, having this little project? Was it hard to feel creative or was it like you had so many crazy ideas and it was just kind of trying to rein it in? <laughs> I don't know. Did you think it was hard to be creative? Not really. No, with you. Like, I'm, yeah. I'm good at working with you. I don't ever have a problem being creative unless, I mean, like points like now where I just finish something and just put it out. Like I feel like I have to take some time and re up my creativity pool or whatever. But uh, yeah, I think for me it was, I, I work a lot and it was kind of an opportunity to just, my business was closed for that whole period of time when I got a loan from the government that was totally forgiven. And so I was like, man, this is a paid vacation. I'm going to do the most with it. And so I think it was really, I think we were really inspired. I know I was because I just got to be a person living in the mountains without any, you know, any responsibilities and just having fun and writing music. And I think that song is, you know, a lot of that song is so good because of that. Makes sense. Yeah, it was also one of the first times where like Justin and I sort of worked together. I think I'd been kind of writing most of this stuff up to that point as yeah. far as the song formats and everything. But we just kind of started jamming. And we're like, let's just make this into a song. And, you know, <laughs> it turned into a 14 minute long song. Uh, it just it was so many ideas just flowing into the next thing. And it all sort of made sense. And we're like, how are we going to finish this up? And then I like grabbed a guitar and stared at the mountains on my porch and I was like, yeah, this is how it's going to go. And it worked out great. So. So you must've spent some time thinking to yourself, like how to describe this album to somebody like what, what does this sound like to you? Where, where are you bringing your influences from? So for each of you, there must be different answers because you're going to have your own idea in your head of how things sound. So if you had to describe this album and if anything you could compare it to for people, what would you say? Well, um, well, that's a pretty difficult question. Um, I, I don't know. It's like, uh, it's definitely a journey, like a sonic journey that you go on. Um, I mean, there's, there's obviously the tool comparison that everyone makes and, and that's, it's hard to get away from because we're both huge, hugely influenced by tool, but there's a lot of other things in there. Um, I hear a lot of Opeth and some Pink Floyd, um, definitely some between the buried and me and parts. Yeah. Um, yeah. Musically, I think, I think that those bands are sort of the core of it along with the electronic stuff. I think we really tried to bring in, I, I just, I was a DJ and producer before I did this band and I was making drum and bass and jungle. And I really, I think ultimately like when I started this band, there was, I could feel the trajectory moving some, towards some sort of like IDM influence in our super prog heavy psychedelicness, And you know, things like Chocolate Chip Trip, honestly, sort of lay the precedent for that because Danny's got a full-on Euro rack. Like, 
making the weirdest glitch noises. And the, the, those sounds make me so happy. <laughs> and um, so, and I think it fits. And I think it's an element we've always played with a computer, not always, but we've, I've always been moving towards playing with a computer, which is part of, you know, part of the member changes and all that um, because you need to be good enough to play with a metronome and stay on it. And with this album, we have videos even that we've made that are like the video that you saw that visualizer video is completely in sync with the song. And because we play with a metronome, we can just throw that in Ableton and put that on a screen and it's perfectly synced with us as long as we play the song. Right. <laughs> so um, we figure, you know, why not if we're the ones generating all these sounds and if we're using our creativity uh, to just add something new, a different texture just creates a different, experience like why not do that even if um even if it's coming from a computer like it's not like it's not musical you know and same with our keyboard parts i'm a piano player and i, I can't bring a piano on tour and in a lot of the times it's pretty hard to jump from keyboard to guitar and sing at the same time doing all of that so i think it makes sense for for us to add these elements in because we are a three piece and it really adds like a cinematic feel to everything and it just makes it more impactful and i you know i come from a huge electronic background where people are playing to ableton and they're making really great music that includes the computer as an instrument and i i really respect that and get super inspired by that so i want to bring that to our music too that's uh, i i think because we were talk, talking earlier, we were making the comparison with a band, uh, Lucid Planet from Australia, and how they and they are also a three piece, and uh, I I think of as, as well like to bring a didgeridoo and somebody to play a flute and a, another vocalist and all these other elements of their music on tour with them all the time would be really really hard. But at the same time, I don't want them to then decide to limit themselves and be like not put it on the album, and right. it's okay with me to just. Yeah, so it, maybe that sound might have came from a computer, but it's not like it's not musical. You don't have to be a complete purist about every little tiny thing. Like I don't expect you to bring an orchestra on tour. <laughs> yeah, and I think there's a healthy balance too, right? Because there's a lot of bands that are literally just playing along to their CD at this point on tour. Like the 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 amount of backing tracks that they have, they have double drums, they have double vocals, they have all of this stuff, and it's just. It's like, why am I even watching you at this point? So I think, I think we try to bring a tasteful balance of how to integrate a computer into a band that is still musical um, and it, you, you're still listening to a performance. Yeah. So w the artwork is something I wanted to get with too. Because uh, you were talking about how we have this visualizer music video for uh, um, so, uh, False Prophet. Is this something that you see continuing with you guys? How do you see the artwork flowing from the beginning to how it's changed to now? Where's most of the artwork kind of come from? Man, I, you know, this album and the last album, the first album, we just had one art piece and we didn't have, we didn't have a ton of money or we didn't just, I don't know. We didn't put a ton of money into the packaging or whatever. Didn't know exactly what we were doing or what we wanted to do. And a lot of bands are moving away from, physical stuff and I don't want to do that at all. I really love having something big with art and lyrics and all that. It just makes it way more of an experience for people. And I listen to vinyl and I love opening up, you know, magical mystery tour and seeing the crazy cartoon book in the middle <laughs> that has the whole magical mystery story on it. Right. So I want to, I want to keep that going because music is becoming so in the, in the box inside the computer, everything's digital and it doesn't feel real anymore. <laughs> and that was our approach to recording too. We wanted to try and really make it sound like something real. A lot of bands use sample drums. Justin doesn't use sample drums. Justin is a really killer player and a really killer engineer and he can get his drums sounding way better than a drum machine and most of the you know hard rock you listen to today is mostly drum machine to be honest so yeah but um back to the art and visuals uh i was most of it's just concepts that i have like i'll think about what the song is about and the lyrics and then i'll kind of get this image in my head of how to describe that through 
mostly metaphor, I think. I think a lot of it's like just trying to have some sort of like subconscious association with the concepts and then trying to get an artist to, to bring those to life is a challenging thing. And Travis Smith, who does artwork for Opeth and Devin Townsend, Devin Townsend, who else? Catatonia. Yeah. And I think he's done like Slayer and all these bands. He's like one of the best album work, album artwork artists out there. And he's done such a good job of taking my weird concepts and bringing them to life. And then this album, because of how the augmented reality thing that we did works, we wanted to work with people who really work in a lot of clear layers because then we can give it to this person, Misha George, who we met uh, through a tool fan page who can animate it animate, he animates all the layers of the artwork and makes it all move and then uploads it. He uploaded it to this augmented reality app where you just download the app and it opens up your, when you open up the app, it opens up your camera and you scan the artwork and it starts playing an animated version of the artwork. That's like perfectly mapped onto the surface that the artwork's on. So it looks like this piece of art has come to life and it plays a minute long hidden piece of music, which we made these uh, remix tracks. We made four remix tracks. And then we got all of our high level donors for our crowdfunding to send us a recording of them saying, we are source and so are you. So the cover is all of our fans saying, we are source and so are you. We made it sound really trippy, like uh, the Borg. And we made it sound like the Borg. And we got, I got really excited. <laughs> yeah, we're Trek nerds. <laughs> Huge Trek nerds. So um so that's and we use those animations in the videos too and then the videos are a combination of me and justin put a lot of time into those videos um we i had had this vision once uh where i kind of saw my band playing at red rocks and i was like wow like this is awesome and there was like this crazy geometry going in the background and i was like wow animated geometry that sounds really expensive to get somebody to do and then I, I the nerd that i am watching all this all these star wars uh kind of making of documentaries and stuff how they use real models for everything and that's why even though star wars was made in 1970 whatever 1970 yeah. probably it looks great man like the death star the ships they all look so good because they're real and we I, I, one thing led to another and we bought a 3d printer <laughs> and <laughs> we printed these geometry pieces that we found on the internet and you know we've listed all the creators of those geometry pieces but then we filmed them on a green screen and put them through some really cool effects and a lot of those uh, images that you see are like real pieces of plastic turned into crazy fractalized geometry things <laughs> Wow. See, just watching the video, you wouldn't realize that that's all the effort that you went into to creating it, right? Yeah. That's that's awesome. And it's funny because those were actually easier than the other piece of that, which is Synesthesia, which is a shader program, which is basically like a visualizer that's programmable. And Justin put so much time into programming the Synesthesia parts for, unfortunately, none of the videos that we've released yet. So we'll have to put more videos out because all of his Synesthesia stuff is really Synesthesia seems to be the the thing that we're going for here, right? Like we want the music and the visual to match up. You're you're really trying to push the boundaries of what you can do with the art form itself, so that it's it's more of an experience to the senses. Absolutely, yeah, it's exactly what we're trying to do. Yeah, I think we want people to like have the most. I don't know, just like whole experience of the music as possible. I think. When you go to when you go see a band like Tool, it's it's a complete experience. Same with like I don't know if you know the DJ Tipper. He's like one of the one of the best producers out there and best DJs. And his audio visual experience is just ridiculous. Like it, it's jaw droppingly good. You just feel like you've entered a completely different world. And, and you know we need to do those things because we don't we have a limited. Uh, quantity supply of those crystals that you ate <laughs> <laughs> yeah actually i don't know the 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 new empire has banned all kyber crystals so i don't know if we'll have any musicians in the future unfortunately <laughs> <laughs> oh, i'm sure we'll find some they'll, they'll be in sweden though yeah uh, they, they <laughs> sweden, that's right <laughs> uh lyrics can we talk about that just a little bit? Because yeah, I'm assuming most of this comes with you, Ben. 
Yeah, I read all the lyrics for sure. So what what kind of what can you say about this album? <laughs> I mean, it's 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 hard to sort of put into like one concise thing. I think it's ultimately the story it's about renunciation. A lot of it is like renouncing, re- renouncing um, bad programming ultimately, I think is what it comes down to. And so the first, uh, the first half of the album is really all about whether it's this taboo or that taboo. I think most of it is about like rejecting that. Um, I think the transition starts really in movements where it's sort of like uh, accepting accepting the confusion that comes with not knowing uh, what really, what the truth really is. Once you've rejected all of this bad programming, like what, what do I move to next? And I think that song is really like the transition piece of like choosing to, choosing to be a human, choosing to be in your body, despite, you know, um, not exactly knowing what the purpose is or why you're doing it, or even if you are doing it sometimes, I think, especially in the last year, a lot of us have felt like, are we, is this real? Or do we exist? Do you exist? <laughs> or is it, I don't, do we exist? And I think, so, so that song is really about, that's, that's sort of where it switches. And it doesn't switch, but it sort of evolves and progresses into looking at death. Um, Cause I think one of the first, at least my personal experience, one of the first things that comes with the uh, conscious choice to live your life, you know, fully engaged, fully embodied is, wow, I'm going to die. And I think when you don't make that choice, you kind of like, you kind of don't care. A lot of people don't care if they're going to die or not. I certainly didn't. I was like, I smoke cigarettes. I hope I die soon. And then (laughs) I had this whole experience when I was younger in a flotation tank and I decided to like, wow, life's really cool. And I want to do this. And the first thing I did was quit smoking cigarettes and I started, you know, I, so I think making that choice makes you think about mortality more. And so the last, there's like, I sort of call it like the death suite where it's like origin, um, gets you back to like the earth and the roots and the real truth and allows, allows people if they're, if they're on, you know, if they're having the journey I'm on anyways with this album, to sort of have a different look at death and see how it's all part of the process. And the thing that uh, sort of presides over all of it is awareness. And um, so, yeah, I think the goddess death is sort of just like really looking death in the face and coming to terms with the fact that this is going to happen and there's no avoiding it. And then paper tiger is sort of about seeing the, the awareness that transcends physicality that I believe and a lot of people believe goes on beyond physicality in some way, shape or form. And whether or not that's just, uh, you know, your subconscious mind stretching time out as long as it can in your final moments or whatever it is. Like, I do think that the awareness um, goes on after death. And so I think that that's sort of, that's what those songs are about. And then Pupa is really the kind of culmination of all of it. Like, now that we've, now that I've seen truth in a different light, how does that apply to humanity, to a grander scheme, to a grander scale of things? And, um, you know, accepting transitions, accepting endings is something that humanity really needs to do because we need the things that we've been doing for a long time. Those need to end. <laughs> we need to find a different way. Cities don't make any sense. Like we've proven now with the lockdown and all this, like so many people don't need to go to work. They could stay at home all day long, be with their animals, be with their families, have the connections that they really want to have and not feel like an automaton. But, you know, the false prophets, the song that's really about like the, the machine wanting you, needing you to be an automaton because it needs control and it can't let go. And so I think the more that we can distance ourselves from the machine and see that we do have the choice to let go, um, I think that's where the real metamorphosis happens. So yeah, that's my that's my take on it. <laughs> it's deep, and I just thought uh, one thing that made me uh, it made me think of is somebody told me a saying back about a year ago. <laughs> they said all the evidence that we get from this uh, 
going on right now with all these billionaires telling us all to go back to work. <laughs> and it, well, it just proves one thing, that billionaires don't make their money. We right. do. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, also with what you were saying before, it's super easy to go through life not really facing your own mortality until somebody forces, something forces you to see it. So it's all really deep stuff. I like it. I like it. Thank you. Yeah, and I think it's you know I think the I think the billionaires and the people that the, I don't almost see it as this like meta like the the shadow of the meta consciousness in a lot of ways, and yeah. that thing, um, it feeds on your fears, and it, like that's why I say uh, in false prophet, my doubt keeps you clinging to life. My indulgence is your demise, and it's really about like letting go of fear so that they can't control you anymore. Yeah. Take that George Soros. Anyway, <laughs> we'll move on. Uh, <laughs> so I like, uh, I like reminiscing about concert memories. So what are some of your favorite concert memories? Ooh. Justin, you want to go first? I sure. have so many. <laughs> um, I have some good ones. Um, a really good one I was thinking of recently was uh, I saw Medeski Martin Wood and Schofield at the Boulder Theater. That was an incredible night. They're really good with Schofield. Yeah, That's yeah, like a sure. whole other. He brings yeah. a whole other vibe. Yeah. Um, I saw a Snarky Puppy. Um, no way. <laughs> like five years ago, and they had Larnell Lewis on the drums. I think also from Vancouver. Um, he's one of the most amazing drummers ever. Um, so check him out if you don't know him, Larnell Lewis. Um, uh, what else? What's another good one? Are you, and the question, are you asking our shows or other people's shows? Just fa just favorite memories. All right, cool. Yeah. Sounds good. <laughs> um, I saw Mark Giuliano recently with his beat music project. Um, that was actually the last concert I saw before lockdown. And that, that one was incredible. He is, he's another monster drummer. There's maybe a theme to my, uh, <laughs> my shows. I like, well, yeah, really we saw, we saw Chick Corea with Dave Weckl. That yeah, was, that was a geez, great show. Man. Oh, wow. Yeah. It was Chick Corea acoustic band, right? Or, yeah. It was acoustic. It was acoustic trio. Yeah. yeah. Just, just the three of them, John Patitucci, Dave Weckl and Chick Corea. Chick spent like 15 minutes explaining Spain and where it came from too. But there's this one Spanish, <laughs> uh, like trumpet song, I think it is that like he says like tons of jazz musicians, including himself, just like straight ripped off. And they were like, yeah, this melody is so good. We just need it. And that's what's cool about jazz. And I think people just need to move to thinking about music more like jazz if they want to continue enjoying music, because there's no way you can keep making the most novel things ever. And jazz is like it just takes one idea and will explore that in completely you know it'll go completely wild with that instead of just like oh this is this was this song and that's that song like people are like i think people are spoiled and i think that they need to see things uh, in a broader perspective to to enjoy music instead of thinking like this song has to be the newest song i've ever heard ever yeah <laughs> anyway sorry, continue um <laughs> i i guess a really fun one was Tool with King Crimson at Red Rocks, like way back in the day. That was a lateralist tour. Um, in fact, I think it was the first time Danny Carey ever used that drum set that was made of the melted down Piesty cymbals. Um, so that was that was a pretty fun show. Uh, my first time ever seeing Tool. Yeah. So I don't. Know, yeah. Um, gosh. I mean, my favorite concert memory is playing for 2,000 people in Minneapolis, opening for Hell Yeah and In Flames. Um, I never played for that many people. And then the next night, we played for almost the same amount of people in Green Bay. Those two shows were so much fun. Um, yeah, it's, yeah, when you have that many people screaming after you finish a, sh finish a song, you're like, it's just, there's, not, there's not a better feeling in the world. Um, Obviously, the first time I saw Tool was probably the most important concert I've ever been to. Uh, I think the last time I saw Tool is probably the best concert I've ever, one of the best concerts I've ever been to. It was their first show back after going and accepting the Grammy. And I've, I, I think it was my 13th Tool show, and I've just never seen them play like that. It was a whole, 
a whole nother level. They were just on fire. Um, and that was the last show I saw before lockdown. So I'm glad it was the best one. Um, other ones that come to mind, Zakir Hussein uh, at the Boulder Theater. Uh, that's one that will have will stay with me forever. I've never seen a real Indian classical music concert until then. And that is, I mean, man, if you get to see Zakir Hussein play tablas, you have to go. It is just, it is a real treat. Anybody, no matter what your understanding of music is, would be floored by that. <laughs> um, gosh, I don't know. Those are the big ones that come to mind. I guess the Chick Corea one's huge too. Um, I see a lot of, you know, for me, it's a lot of like, I saw Fotec, like, there no like most people have no idea what I'm talking about, but if you listen to Jungle Drum and Bass, like Fotec is the best. Like he's the best drum and bass producer. Well, really, Jungle producer that there ever was, and was one of the founding fathers of my favorite electronic music ever. And I saw him play in Denver, and that was like, you know, just so so good, <laughs> like so good. So I don't know. I think a lot of my favorite things are like more obscure things that a lot of people don't know about so much um but that's where a lot of my influences come from at the same time what advice would you give to anyone who's just trying to achieve their dreams don't quit (laughs) it's the only way to do it (laughs) like there's only one thing like you just have to keep showing up and you can't quit yeah and you know even if you never make it like you never do the thing you wanted to do at least you spent your life trying Like I could never sit and stare at a wall in an office building just because, Oh, I might not, it might not work out. Like that's never going to work for me. It might not work out is not an excuse to sit there and stare at a wall in an office building all day long. (laughs) And I'd say just do whatever you can to put in like even 10 minutes a day at something. Um, If you can just do that daily, you know, maybe you skip a day here and there, but you know, the consistency, if you can just show up consistently, I think that is a huge thing. Um, it goes a long way. Do Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Seriously. <laughs> like, if you do Brazilian jiu-jitsu and you really learn it, you'll learn how to learn anything. It's it's the mo- one of the most powerful things you can do with your time. Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Seriously, go do that. <laughs> yeah. Wise words from people who know everybody. <laughs> uh is there anything else that you guys would like to say to our listeners? <laughs> um, mostly like go buy our music because we're really trying to be on the forefront of making the music industry for musicians instead of assholes who just steal money from people. <laughs> so yeah, we did Amen. this whole album ourselves. We recorded it all ourselves. Uh, because we just wanted to save money and see what we could do. And I think at this point, like we're so happy with how it sounds that we don't really want to pay anybody else to make music for us when we could do it ourselves. So um, yeah, this is about as DIY as it gets. We made all the recordings ourselves. The only thing we didn't do was mastering Hackle uh, from the band Tesseract mastered everything. And yes. it was really, really good. Um, and We did all the videos ourselves. We did all the physical production ourselves. You know, we didn't make the artwork ourselves, but all those concepts come from us. Like it is the most self-generated thing in the music industry that I can think of. So if, if we want music to continue, especially after what we've seen in the past year, musicians have to start working for themselves and the industry has to start shifting towards being musician run as opposed to, asshole run <laughs> so yeah go check out our album it's on all the streaming sites but uh if you want to there's we've got just over 30 copies left of this really awesome box set that we did that has the five augmented reality art pieces with the remixes and it's got all the lyrics it's the booklet's 12 inches by 12 inches the box is 13 inches by 13 inches uh it comes with a cd and mp3 download card uh we even 3d printed little uh source sigils uh for everyone in the box set as well so it's a really unique thing like uh, when i was doing the augmented reality all the way through the for the first time i was like this is so much cooler than even fear inoculum and i when i got fear inoculum i held that and i was like this is the coolest thing i've ever held in my hands and then i made something even cooler than that i think so um 
we yeah you know, we've worked so hard on this and it's been such a group effort in so many ways and i think it shows you know we've moved out to the mountains so that we could be more you know in our more of our element and i think that all all of this the all the stuff that we did to make this really special comes through so yeah go yeah. go check it out and listen to it and then uh, we've got a virtual concert coming up uh, June 5th, June 5th, June 5th. Yeah. So we, we filmed it and recorded it already, made it sound really nice. Got our homie, Randy Edwards to do all the video, uh, videography and editing of it. And yeah, we'll be broadcasting that through our website on June 5th. And yeah. Uh, so check that out. It's pretty much the entire album. Um, yeah. In a live setting. Yeah. With all the visualizer videos too, we had a nice big projector doing all that. And Randy did a really good job of editing in the visuals. So he like layered it over the video in certain parts. So it, this is, you just can't get bored. There's no way. Like the music's already ridiculously good. But then the audio visual experience, the whole thing is very awesome. So it's listen to source.com. And we don't have the, the ticket link up yet because we haven't made the portal yet. But it'll be up there soon. So um, yeah, June 5th, it will definitely be up there. And uh, yeah, seven o'clock mountain time. So that's six o'clock your time there over on the West Coast. You've been listening to the Peach Pit, everybody. I've been here talking with Ben and Justin from the band Source from Boulder, Colorado. Their album is out now. You need to go check it out. And you guys, thank you so much for taking time to talk to me. Hopefully we can do it again in the future. Thank you, man. Yeah, listen to source.com is where you get our music. You can also get it on all streaming sites. And thank you so much for having us on, man. Yeah, thank you. Everybody go check out Ethereal Self now. See you guys. See ya. Take care. Thanks, man. That was really fun.